Hello, everyone, and it is with great pleasure that our next speaker is Elizabeth Christensen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Post Just for Newbies. I am doing a speaker for newbie. This is my first time speaking at a Postgres event by myself, um, so take it easy on me with your questions later. <laughs> um, um, I'm Elizabeth Christensen. I work at Crunchy Data. I work um, on our content team, and I do a lot of blog writing and public-facing stuff, and I write some tutorials and different things about Postgres. I also attend a lot of developer events, so you might see me around. I am in a co-organizer of Post Just Day, which happens every year in November. Um, I volunteer for PGUS, which is the United States counterpart to PGEU that's helping get this event today off the ground, and I organized the Kansas City Postgres user group. If you're ever in the States or near Kansas City, we love to host um, people from out of town, so let me know. I'm on Twitter at SQLiz, and I'm an extrovert who works from home, so feel free to make friends with me online. <laughs> um, so a little roadmap of what we're going to talk about today, um, just the PostGIS project itself, um, getting started in PostGIS, loading data, and some of the tools used um, in that world, um, some of the special PostGIS functions and things for spatial SQL, and then how to get um, PostGIS data out of the database. Um, I have a little demo of some Paris data that I'm going to show off mostly in screenshots. Um, I wasn't totally sure what my internet situation would be today, so this is not a live demo. Um, but it's still pretty fun. So <clears throat> um, at a super high level, PostGIS in your database is going to add um, three new data types for handling spatial data. Um, the foundational data type is the point, which is just a single latitude and longitude location. And then there's lines, which are a path between two or more points, and then a polygon, which would be three or more latitude, longitude pairs and points to enclose an area. So with those new data types in your database, you can then do other things with those pieces of data, like store them and query them and transform them and do all kinds of fancy mapping stuff. Um, PostGIS is the open source alternative to several closed source projects. Um, Esri is definitely kind of the dominating um, industry leader for closed source GIS, and they have a desktop tool called ArcGIS, um, and then Oracle and Microsoft also have um, spatial capabilities. If you're thinking about working um, with open source geospatial or getting started and you hear these tools thrown around, it's always a good time to introduce PostGIS into the mix. Um, PostGIS is used in a lot of places where you know, maps are used where location data is used, and that, you know, has to do with the obvious things like mapping and, and the military and, and NASA. Um, but there's a lot of really cool post just use cases I've seen out in the world where people are um, mapping and, take, you know, keeping track of where our water goes. Um, people um, working on hurricane prevention using post just. Um, there's a lot of routing. Um, I've seen people in developing nations using um, post just to kind of do land planning and talk about how they want to do some of their land development. Um, I've also seen some cool non-geospatial non use cases for post just So you can use post just outside geospatial just as a spatial system. Um, and there are people that do um, research on like neuro networking and all kinds of interesting stuff like that. Um, the PostGIS project itself is an extension of Postgres, um, but the project is overseen by an organization called OzGeo, the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. 
Um, OzGeo sponsors an event um, called FOSS4G, the Friends of Open Source Conferences, um, and they have some really cool events, and some of you may have heard of those or been to them. Um, so the OzGeo project space is pretty vast. So PostGIS is the database underneath kind of a bigger umbrella of OzGeo projects, including um, several libraries that you'll hear kind of referenced. And when you work in PostGIS, you'll see things like the GDAL library or the JTS library. Um, and then they have several mapping tools under their umbrella as well, and then a couple desktop apps that help you kind of work with GIS. Um, and I also threw up the sort of core contributor team for PostGIS. And if you, you know, see these people around at events and stuff, they're a great wealth of information. Um, this is kind of a fun little map that the government of New Zealand put out about sort of their open source GIS stack and what is included in it. Um, and so you can see that kind of that open source GIS stack has post GIS in the middle, and then there are, you know, mobile tools to let you enter data in the field. There's desktop tools for actually working with the maps and for working with data. There's processing services, and then, you know, there's other things down the road that'll let you kind of turn those things into web-based maps and application data. Um, aside from the kind of getting things to the web mapping, there's a pretty big ecosystem built around um, data analysis in the PostGIS world as well. Um, this is a graphic that a company called Cardo put out. Um, they build kind of software for PostGIS analytics. And in the PostGIS analytics world, there's kind of PostGIS as the foundational piece, and then there's a lot of development on top of either Python or R or some of these other third-party tools to kind of build a, a data analysis pipeline. Um, this is just a little map of kind of how the libraries work and, and how they go to all of the different pieces of the PostGIS ecosystem. Um, and PostGIS, like any other um, extension to Postgres, is separately versioned. Um, so it will have some compatibility with current versions of Postgres that you'll sort of need to check as you, you know, maintain compatibility between your core Postgres version and your PostGIS version. PostGIS does release a full point version every year. So as, you know, 16 comes out um, this fall, um, PostGIS 3.4 will come out, um, and then they do a couple, you know, bug patches a year as well. Okay, so talking, um, turning towards like actually getting post just going, um, you can obviously do a local install and compile post just yourself. There's Docker containers out there with a bunch of post just and associated tools installed with it if you don't want to do it yourself. Um, and, and also an easy way to get started with PostGIS if you don't want to mess with any of that stuff is just to use one of the cloud or fully managed um, solutions. You can get PostGIS installed on Amazon RDS or Google Cloud. Um, Crunchy Data has a fully managed Postgres too. Um, when you get PostGIS going, the create extension PostGIS will install most of the things you need for the data types and processing and stuff. And then they recommend um, this list of extensions. Um, so, you know, the, the raster is going to give you some capabilities to export raster graphics. Um, the topology will let you create topological objects that have faces and edges and nodes. Um, the FSC GAL lets you do um, some kind of 2D and 3D stuff. Um, and then fuzzy string match and, and the rest of the list is kind of related to um, standardizing addresses and stuff like that. So once you actually install PostGIS in your database, you'll have a new table in your database called spatial underscore ref underscore sys. Um, and this is the spatial reference system table. So um, there are like two or 3,000 ways 
that you can do um, math on the face of our spherical Earth, um, and there are various ways that people do that math, and that is um, represented in different reference systems. Um, in general, when you're getting data, like if you're just grabbing random data from the internet or you're getting data from your city, um, you should be able to find the spatial reference system. Um, in general, the spatial reference system, is, if you have a big, big Earth, is not going to be as important as working in really tiny areas where things like meters and feet matter. Um, and if you, the 4326 spatial reference ID is pretty much like common amongst PostGIS. So you'll see that if you kind of, you know, are out there on, you know, Stack Overflow or whatever and looking for different queries, you'll see that out there a lot. Um, so just like Postgres, there's several GUIs for doing work on PostGIS. Um, you can do PostGIS work um, and see um, a geometry viewer in PG Admin and dBeaver. Um, both of them kind of have their own little graphical interface um, for working with map data. Um, and then QGIS is kind of a, a special desktop app that's really more for working with, um, working with map layers and working with spatial data. Um, I'm going to show you some screenshots from dBeaver and QGIS because those are the tools that I find easiest to use, but obviously you're welcome to use whatever you think is easiest. Um, so in terms of data sources, one of the really cool things that, about PostGIS and one of the reasons I like talking about it and kind of playing with it is that there's so much data available to do cool things with it. Um, so there's, uh, there's a project called OpenStreetMap, which is not associated with OzGeo, but is its own sort of open community of map makers. Um, and they let you come in and get maps. Um, there's a company called GeoFabrique that takes the OpenStreetMap data every day and dumps it into like little tiny pieces. Um, so you don't have to download and install the entire OpenStreetMap. You can like pick a city um, like Paris or pick a certain region of the world and work with those open street maps. Um, there's natural earth data, which is also really nice and comes in a series of scales. So if you want to just like play with a full map of the earth, natural earth data has that at a couple different um, scales. And then there's also just regional offices and cities and all kinds of people that will publish um, files that you can use um, and kind of get map data and other um, stuff from. So if you are out in the world, you, you might see um, an OSM file, which is an OpenStreetMap file. You might see a shape file or a TIFF. Um, even ping files can have location data in them. Um, and then you know there's um, more sophisticated vector files that um, like Google Earth's KML files and GeoJSON and stuff like that. Um, so the files that I kind of played around with to go through the rest of the slides I have today, um, I got a shape file of the arrondissements of Paris from the city. Um, that's just a super simple um, file, really small and easy to use. Um, I got a bunch of, sh of OSM layers from the GeoFabrique. Um, and I've got different layers that I can use, like the buildings and locations of interest and roads all separated so I can choose which things I want to use. Um, and then later, um, I'll work with um, a full open street map file of Paris. So um, to add data, there's a couple of different options. Um, you can add data through the QGIS tool. So you can just open up QGIS. It's just its own desktop tool. You can add a vector layer and just browse and find the shapefile that you loaded, and it will load that for you as a layer. Um, and then QGIS is um, a tool that you generally people use to kind of add their own stuff, right? Like their own layers, their own labels, like you know little um, things, and then they might export that as a graphic. Um, QGIS will sync with your PostgreSQL database. 
Um, and so this is a view of the database in dBeaver. And you can see I've loaded my Arrondissements table. Um, it's showing up on a um, Google, like an open street map sort of underneath the data. Um, they'll, they'll do a little preview for you. You can't actually query or use the data. It's just part of the preview. Um, and then you'll see I also have a table of QGIS projects now that's been added to my database. So if I'm you know, adding things or changing labels, QGIS will save that in the database. And then you know, um, if I have colleagues or whoever wants to work on that same data, they can do that. Um, so if you want to load anything um, big, bigger than something really simple, you'll have to use some of the like utilities. Um, these are kind of similar to like the post copy command. Um, so the OGR stands for Open GIS Simple Features Reference Implementation, and this is part of like the GDAL functions that you installed when you installed PostGIS. Um, so here is just like a little incantation to run the OGR2 to OGR, which will import um, so at the top, you've got, you know, I'm calling the OGR command, and then I've got my database host. I've got the file I'm calling from, which is the Paris Roads shape file, and then I'm creating a table called Paris Roads. And then this will load that into my database. So now I have a Paris Roads table in my database, um, and if you load OpenStreetMap data, you'll get like an OpenStreetMap ID, you'll get like names and various information, and then you'll see that you'll have that geometry, that line string that's calling out um, the information about that item. So the cool thing about like layering using QGIS or any of this other stuff is that Post just does all the work itself under the hood to tie your data together. So you can get um, like a random neighborhood around response file from the city of Paris and an open street map file, and they just tie together for you and layer on top of each other. OK, so now that we um, have Post just installed, we loaded a couple pieces of data. Let's look at some SQL. So at a high level, you're gonna, we have the data types we talked about, and then there's a bunch of spatial functions that do either querying or transforming or kind of doing special things. I think there's like 200 spatial functions that just come with a post just install. And then there's some indexing that we'll look at too. OK, so at a super high level, you can just select any piece of a row in uh, a database table. So if I want to look for the street that we're on today, and I want to just say, like, show me the road in the Paris Roads table, you know, I like Rue Saint-Martin, it'll show us the road that we're on right now. And you can do the same thing with a polygon. You can find Arrondissement 3, the shape of the polygon, and then you can see um, the data underneath that, too. Um, so then you can do things like use the st-intersect function to join two separate pieces, um, two separate tables, right? So I have my neighborhoods table and I have my roads table, and now here's a query that I can find the roads that are residential um, in Arrondissement 3, and then you'll see here that that's how that query comes out. Um, so if I want to do something like calculating an area, I can use the stArea function. Um, so I'll just look for the area forum around as Mon3. OK, so this data, though, is a really small number. And why is that? That's because you're querying the database about um, latitude and longitude, right? And um, those are going to be pretty small increments um, since you're talking about the entire globe. If you want to get data um, in you know, meters, miles, something that's like human readable, you'll need to cast the data to geography. So here's that same area query that I just used to cast where I'm casting from ge 
Geom2 geography, and you can see in square meters I get like a human readable number. So the function st length will let you calculate length, and you can do that same casting to find that, and then obviously you can divide by 1,000 if you want to get something in kilometers. So here's that query. OK, so let's say I want to do some more fun stuff with the data I've got, right? Like if I want to know how far we are from the Eiffel Tower, I'm going to need to know the latitude and longitude location of the Eiffel Tower. So um, getting the exact latitude and longitude location for a place is called geocoding. And there's a couple different ways that this can happen. Um, if you have a big database and you're doing lots of stuff, you can do this in your database, right? Like you can take in queries and geocode them, um, and then you can put that in your next query. Um, there are API services that do sort of geocoding for you um, because it can be pretty intensive, especially if you're doing things like taking addresses in and the addresses aren't fully formed or they're maybe incomplete. Um, they're like for the United States has an open geocoding um, API that you can use for the postal service. Um, so there's kind of a couple ways that can happen. Um, if you're just messing around, you can just find, um, find the point, like a centroid in, in a location. And so that's what I did, and I'll kind of use that um, in this next example. So if I want to find distance between two places, I can use the st distance function. Um, and so I'll do an st make point, which is another function to just create a point. Um, I'll cast it in geography, and then I'll use the OpenStreetMap ID for the street that we're on, and I now know that we're about 4.6 kilometers from the Eiffel Tower. Um, another really popular thing that people do with the ST distance function is nearest neighbor queries. So if you want to know, for example, what are the other things in the locations of interest table that are nearest to this point, you can ask um, for something like this. So if I want to actually get us a route to the Eiffel Tower from where we're at right now, um, I'm actually going to need another PostGIS extension called PG Routing. Um, PG Routing will just install like an, its own extension, and then there's another um, data loading tool called OSM to PG Routing that will take an OpenStreetMap file and it will do a bunch of processing and load that in as two new tables in your database. Um, so PG routing will add a topology table, and that'll create all of the like different nodes and lines and kind of the ways that you can go. And then it will create a, a vertices table that has all of the places where the route can deviate. So here is what the PG routing ways vertices data table looks like. So it's just a bunch of little points. So um, if I want to actually get my route, I will need to use um, one of a couple algorithms that comes with PG routing. Um, this example uses the PGR Dijkstra algorithm. Um, this is named after a mathematician who did a bunch of work in terms of fighting the shortest distance between a number of points. Um, the PG routing um, ways table will have its own IDs for different elements, um, and that's part of what got loaded in when I loaded that data. Um, and so I'll use those IDs, and I can actually get, with one query, a little route from where we're at right now to the Eiffel Tower. Um, PG routing is awesome. Um, and it is really cool, and it works sort of fresh and dynamic, um, but it can be like really resource intensive in a production use case of Postgres. Um, there are some other like third party tools, one of them's called Valhalla, that will do some of this for you. Um, 
So kind of depending on what you need to do in production. Um, and then also just touching a little bit on um, indexing. Um, so if you're doing any substantial amount of work in PostGIS or you've loaded a large table, um, you'll definitely want to look at getting an index on the geometry that you have loaded. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that if you're not indexing something, every query is just going to sequentially scan the entire database. So um, the indexing that's used in the PostGIS and the geospatial world is the GIST index. Um, GIST stands for Generalized Search Tree Index. And it uses the R tree method, um, which has to do with locations. And um, the R, I believe, stands for rectangle. Um, so this is obviously different from the B tree um, index that you would use on like text fields and other data types. Um, you have to call out the gist um, part in your actual index call um, if you just Put, if you don't put using just, it'll just create, it'll default to a B-tree index. Um, and then you'll specify that you want to put an index on that geometry column. OK, so um, switching a little bit to talk about exposing PostGIS data, um, there's some com common file formats that are going to be used by you know, either your front-end application, either if it's um, a piece of data like it's JSON, or if it's actual maps and images. Um, the MVT file format is what's used for Mapbox, which is a common um, web framework for geospatial. Um, you might want vector images. You might have you know, Google Earth files. Um, there's several functions just built straight into PostGIS that will get this data out for you. Um, and those are pretty common. And then um, there are a couple other ways that people get PostGIS data out um, using middleware. So. Um, on the right um, is a, an OzGeo project called GeoServer, um, and that just kind of ties into your PostGIS database, will serve out um, you know, vector files or map files based on whatever you need. Um, and then there are two other projects that are sponsored by um, Crunchy, and those are PG TileServe and PG FeatureServe. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple things with those. Um, so PG Feature Serve lets you retrieve GeoJSON from PostGIS with a REST API. So it sort of tacks on as this little lightweight kind of web server thing, and then you can just grab all the data you need with an API. Um, if you run Feature Serve, it has a little previewer mode too, so you can kind of look at it and test your queries. Um, here's an example of just like a Feature Serve that I asked for um, the neighborhood that we're in now. Um, if you're exporting tiles out of PostGIS, um, there's obviously different resolutions that you'll be wanting to deliver tiles. Um, and so that just sort of depends on the granularity that you want that delivered in. Um, there's PostGIS will give you raster or vector files, kind of depending on what you want. Um, raster files um, are a little bit less demanding um, resource-wise. Um, vector files are a little bit more um, demanding on the end user hardware, but have a little bit more data in them. Um, so here's an example of a couple just um, tile serve works just like feature serve. It's another little like kind of tack on. Um, and here's like a couple tiles that I pulled out um, at different levels of looking at the Arondas Mons. So um, kind of wrapping up here, uh, you're not a PostGIS newbie anymore. Um, 
And if you want to know a little bit more about PostGIS and kind of play around with stuff, um, the PostGIS project has a, an intro workshop that's pretty thorough and, and takes quite a bit of time to get through. And it has a lot more of the functions than I showed you today. Um, Crunchy Data has a little Postgres playground. Um, and we have a PostGIS tutorial um, that has some New York City data loaded into it. Um, and then a couple of people that I follow that I really like, um, kind of what they do and how they teach people about PostGIS. Um, Paul Ramsey is at Crunchy Data. Um, Regina Obey, um, she and her husband wrote all the books on PostGIS, and, and they're excellent. Um, Ryan Lambert um, does some really cool stuff. He's got a little consulting company called Rust Proof Labs. Um, Cliff Patterson does a lot of webinars. He has a, a PostGIS kind of consulting company, and he does a lot of cool stuff with QGIS. Um, and then Cardo also does some fun stuff. And PostGIS Day is um, every year. This year it'll be on November 16th, and it's virtual. Um, it's a conference. All the talks are like 30 minutes, um, and we start really early in the morning to accommodate our friends in Europe, and then we go till pretty late at night for all the West Coast people, um, and it's a pretty fun event. Um, and then there's several companies that do commercial support for PostGIS. Um, this is a list that PostGIS publishes um, for the community, um, for people that are doing consulting and also contributing to the PostGIS project. Um, and then um, Auslandia is actually here in France. I don't know if anyone from uh, Auslandia is here today, but I've worked with them before, and they're all great. So yeah, I will take any questions that you guys have. Well, well, that was a really interesting talk. Um, it's uh, super interesting. Um, from my perspective, GIS are really a fun way to interact with your environment. And also, a uh, fun fact, the centroid of the city of Marseille in South France is right in the water. <laughs> <laughs> so th th there's a lot of fun little tidbits you can discover about cities when they're represented as polygons. Yeah. Thank you very much for this talk. Yeah. Thank you so much to the organizers and sponsors of Post Just Day. It was a real pleasure being here. Thank you.